last day here in Pittsburgh today, but the bad weather has gone north of us, and we should be fine for the first game of this series as the Reds have the day off yesterday. Continue this 11-day, 10-game, three-city road trip tonight. Reds and the Pirates on Fox Sports Ohio. And hi, and a good evening, everyone, on this bow tie Tuesday, and welcome to Reds Baseball, along with Chris Wells, Jim Couch, the Reds and the Pirates in the first game of this three-game get-together here at PNC Park, and Chris, we will get to see for the second time this year, the young phenom of the Reds, Michael Lorenzen, get the start. Well, Jim, you and I both got to see him an awful lot in spring training. We were very impressed each and every time he took the baseball, and he did not disappoint us when he took the ball the first time against the Brewers at home at Great American Ballpark, and he threw the ball well. You know he had to have major butterflies going on, first major league start. His mom was there in the stands. His brothers were there. His agent was there. And he availed himself very well with a five-inning, three-run performance overall. He gave up three run, home runs, but those mostly came on fastballs. This guy's got great stuff, but you can't raise the bar of expectation too high. He's still working on a secondary stuff, but my, oh, my, he's got some kind of high ceiling. His mount opponent tonight, the left-hander out of New Hampshire, Jeff Law. 27-year-old, he's a guy that is more of a control pitcher than a power pitcher. He adds, he subtracts, he throws a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's all about fastball command for Jeff Locke, and we'll find out if he's got that on the beam tonight. Well, the Reds and the Pirates got together, three-game series in Cincinnati to open the campaign. Reds won all three of those. They try to recapture that mojo here tonight. USA Regional Tourism Network. Stay close to CincinnatiUSA.com. By Chevy. Check out our award-winning lineup only at your Tri-State Chevy dealer. And by Skyline Chili. Feeling good? It's Skyline time. I'm Jim Day. Second time the Pirates and Reds will do battle this season. And you got to believe the Pirates think they owe the Reds one. It was the opening series of the season. It's part of our Elk and Elk storylines. And it was a good series for Cincinnati. It was a three-game sweep to begin the season. Kicked off on opening day when Todd Frazier hit that three-run home run in the eighth off of Watson. Opening night, Votto wins it in the 11th. 
And then on April 9th, Gregory Polanco providing the help for the Reds. A sinking line drive off the bat of Marlon Bird. The Reds win three straight over the Buccos. And we'll see how fired up the Pirates are to get back at the Reds tonight as we go upstairs with the gentleman that will call the game, Jim Kelch and Chris Welsh. And guys, this, uh, this is the last divisional opponent they'll see in quite a while, as big a series as you can get in early May. All they'll play this month of May basically is out of the division. Oh, you're right, Jim. And, and I think there were a lot of people who took a look at the schedule early on and said, you know, there's so many division opponents, and some of those are highly ranked and highly thought of, like the Cardinals and the Pittsburgh Pirates team. If the Reds can emerge from this part of the schedule, out of the month of April, with about a 500 record, that's not so bad. And they are right there right now. They're poised to take on the outside baseball world. But first, a three game set right here against the Pirates. They took care of him at home in Cincinnati early in the season. We'll see if we can take care of business here at PNC Park. Well, they did not face this left hander Jeff Locke in Cincinnati, but here's the lineup that he will face today. Put out by Brian Price and brought to you by Meyer. Billy Hamilton, Marlon Berg for the first time as a red in the two spot. Then Joey Votto. The middle of the lineup includes Frazier, Phillips, and Bruce. And in the bottom three, there's Christopher Negron making his first start of the year at shortstop. Brian Pena eighth. Michael Lorenz in ninth. Christopher Negron uh, gets the start at short. Zach Kozart's index finger on the right hand still bothering him. I don't think it's a serious injury. Certainly has not uh, uh, not broken or anything like that. But you give him a few days off to make sure that he, you know, the problem with having an index finger problem on your throwing hand is you can't throw. You can't even practice throwing. So that's why Negron is in there today. Right-handed hitter who will give the Reds a little bit of energy. But first, Billy Hamilton. Against the left-hander, 27-year-old out of North Conway, New Hampshire, Jeff Locke, two and one, with a 4.76 ERA. He gets Hamilton, Bird, and Votto to get it started. We are underway from Pittsburgh at PNC Park with a strike at the knees to Billy Hamilton, who had the day off on Sunday down in Atlanta, and the day off here yesterday, the team off day. So two off days in a row for him. He tries to bunt his way on. But he bumps it in the air and it's caught at first by Pedro Alvarez. Take a look at the Pirates defensively behind Locke. Brought to you by your local four dealers. Arte is in left. McCutcheon is in center. Polanco is the right fielder. That's the lineup they like to see out there all the time. The infield is Gong at third. Mercer the shortstop. Walker at second. Alvarez at first. Francisco Cervelli does the catching for Jeff La uh, Jeff Locke and yes that is Jung Ho Gung getting the start only his third start of the year over at third base replacing Josh Harrison who signs that big deal while the Pirates are in uh, Cincinnati to start the season and he's not really hit much this year. No he's scuffling right now Josh Harrison is and I think those that have watched him closely as a Pirate feel that just a matter of time until he gets on track in the meantime. Clint Hurdle's going to uh, mix a match out there at third base until they try to get Harrison back on the beam. You're talking about a couple of uh, big time contributors to the fired offense last year. Harrison and McCutcheon who both come into this game under 200. Against the shift a diving stop and a throw and they've got him at first base. What a play defensively by the Pirates right there. You don't see that many shifts on right handed hitters. They do to Marlon Bird batting second hits a shot. I mean he is all over this pitch and laying out for it is Neil Walker the second baseman in the shortstop spot and he gets up throwing a great stretch at the other end by Alvarez and a pick and despite the fact that Marlon Bird still gets down the line and was hustling hard they got him by a hair. You can see the theatrics behind Bird there by Billy Hatcher doing a little bit of umpiring. He thought he was safe, Man, but that well, was that, a heck of a play. That is some kind of defensive play right there. Well, the Pirates are really the team that has exploited the shift probably in the uh, within the division, the National League Center more than anyone. They take a hit away from Marlon Bird there. So two quick outs. The batter is Joey Votto. Votto comes in at 323 with seven home runs. He's driven in 17. He's always done well against the Pirates. And always done pretty well in this ballpark. He 
into left field. Marte hanging out there. He'll make the play, and thanks to a terrific defensive play by Neil Walker, Jeff Loft has a one-two-three first. The Reds is the right hander, the right hander Michael Lorenzen. And Chris, you said a lot of nice things about him on the open, but one of the things in that opening game against Milwaukee that he did was throw 107 pitches in five innings. Well, you, you expect that out of a youngster. You also expect that out of a, a young pitcher that throws as hard as Michael Lorenzen does. Anytime a power pitcher dials it up there as hard as he does, you're bound to miss some bats and your pitch count is bound to rise. So this 23 year old out of Anaheim who grew up an Angels fan makes a second big league start. It comes against the Pirates here in Pittsburgh. He gets Gregory Polanco to lead things off. Polanco in the leadoff spot now for the fifth consecutive game supplanting Josh Harrison. I can't believe that swing by Polanco to start the bottom of the first inning. He was determined to swing no matter where that pitch was. Quickly falls behind now. No balls and two strikes. This young man is is still growing. I mean he's about six five and he's only around two hundred pounds. They figure by the time he's all finished growing and filling in he's going to look more like Dave Parker than he looks right now. I mean somewhere around the two fifty mark. He'll hit this ball on the ground to Votto. Nice backhand pick and throw off the mound quickly was Lorenzen. And that ends up being a 3 1 put up. Take a look at the Pirates lineup set forth by Clint Hurdle. Polanco, now Cervelli, McCutcheon on deck, Neil Walker, Starling Marte, and Pedro Alvarez. Then there's Jung Ho Gung playing third base, batting seventh. Mercer and Jeff Locke rounds things out. Francisco Cervelli batting in the number two spot everyday catcher on this Pittsburgh club former New York Yankee. He's out in front of it looked like an off speed pitch from Lorenzo there for strike one. Cervelli comes over here from the Yankees in the Justin Wilson deal they gave up a pretty good relief pitcher for this guy once they've Knew that uh, Russell Martin was not going to be coming back here to Pittsburgh in 2015. Cervelli is a guy that is very highly thought of defensively. Uh, he catches and throws very well. Uh, he hasn't been able to take a lot of advantage of the playing time he had in New York, but they feel like maybe playing every day here in Pittsburgh will give him an opportunity to kind of grow into it. I don't believe he has batted second in the order, except for this game this year. All right, now, excuse me, you go back a couple of times early in April, he batted second. He's at a ball and two strikes with a 262 average. Four runs batted in for Cervelli.
I got love the way that Lorenzen early on is just going right after the hitters getting ahead of them. His repertoire I'm sure you guys talked about it last Wednesday includes other than the fastball. A slider uh, and, and two different kinds of fastballs really and that's important to note he's got a four seamer and a two seamer that'll sink and a change up a little more reluctant to throw the change but it can be in a very good pitch for him. Bruce on a long run toward the line dives and he cannot come up with it but a good effort by the Reds right fielder. Trying to make the catch in that ball off the bat of Cervelli. This is one of these ballparks here at PNC Park really pretty yard but they give you a little bit of room down either line in foul territory. Normally the stands are about where Jay Bruce took a dive right there. That's a good effort considering the fact that he dove on essentially is what a, a track and field surface is. Full of gravel now going into his shirt and down his pants. Scuffing up his arms a little bit on a foul ball. His teammates believe me. They see that and they notice that. He gets himself set back up again in right field and awaits this one two pitch now to the pirate catcher. To the right of Negron. And he got him at first two out. Take a look at the Reds defensively brought to you by your four dealers. Out of left field is Marlon Byrd, Hamilton in center, Bruce and right. The infield on the left side is Ranger and Negron. The right side Phillips and Votto. Battery of Lorenzen and Pena will focus on Christopher uh, Negron getting only his second big league start at shortstop. He made one last year late in the season in Chicago. But when you look at his minor league numbers he's played as much shortstop as he's played anywhere. Took over on Sunday in the second half of the game down in Atlanta when Cozart went out. He gets a second chance here in the first inning. He makes that play and throws out Andrew McCutcheon. And so Michael Lorenzen, like Jeff Locke, has a one, two, three, first. Frazier with eight Joey Votto with seven 15 home runs between the two so far this year time for the most by National League teammates the Dodgers Adrian Gonzalez and Jock Peterson also have 15 the Reds this year and the Dodgers the top two teams in hitting the long ball in the National League the Dodgers with 39 Reds with 34 that's our IGS energy feature for tonight's game. That's what Frazier has been supplying as of late either long ball or unfortunately for him nothing. Last four hits and 30 at bats all home runs for the Reds third baseman. Todd starts the game at 215 eight home runs. 
Tied with Adrian Gonzalez for the National League lead. Driven in 17. It's this ball pretty well to right center, and the Reds have taken the lead. Todd Frazier has taken over the National League lead in home runs with number nine. He goes the other way into right center field, and the Reds have taken a 1-0 lead. That's a good approach by Todd Frazier. He's a very dangerous hitter, and he likes the ball away and will drive it a long way if he gets a pitch up in the zone, and he does right here. And you can see where it is. It says number two on it, and it is tattooed. Well, he is one of the stronger hitters in this league. And when you go opage as a right hander here at PNC Park, you've hit one. First home run of the year given up by Locke in 22 and two thirds innings coming into this game. That's a remarkable stat right there. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned, Frazier now the league leader in home runs. Nice to see a couple of Reds on that leaderboard. It is talked about the two of them. Nine now for Frazier, 35 for the Reds. And how about Frazier? Five for his last 31. All five of those hits home runs. You project out. Frazier hit his career best 29 home runs last year. In 157 games, he already has nine in 25 games this year. Into right, and a base hit for Phillips after getting behind in the count. So, first two Reds have reached here in inning number two. Uh, getting a hit in the count, very important for Jeff Locke because he's pretty much of a contact pitcher. Doesn't have a, a put away pitch. But there you see, after he leads off with a first pitch ball and the count after a 1 0 count. Batting average against him is 378 after an 01. It's down in the 180s. So first pitch strikes very important to most pitchers, but even more so to this left hander. So now Jay Bruce. Bruce had a couple of hits 14 at bats in the series down in Atlanta. He comes in at 181 with five homers driven in 15. If there's a positive about what's been going on with Jay lately, tail end of the homestand against Milwaukee, first leg of this road trip in Atlanta is that he is making better contact than he was for a while. He'll float this one out into right, and that's a hit. That's three consecutive hits now by the Reds. The homer by Frazier, back to back singles in the right by Phillips, and now Bruce. Well, Jay, the one reason why he's making better contact, although this one is not great contact, it doesn't matter. You're going to have some of these fall in, it is the fact that he's simply keeping his front side in. I mean, his right hip and his right shoulder are not flying open uh, as they do during his slumps. And, you know, that builds even more confidence, which he keeps him closed even more. And it can be one of these building things that can just get better and better. Quick conversation between the catcher Cervelli, the pitcher Locke. Locke career wise, two and one in seven starts against Cincinnati. They get Christopher Negron now. Here's a guy who was uh, very good the second half of last year upon his call up from Louisville, but has not gotten off to a very good start this year with the Reds. One for 23, over his last 21. He had a hit against Milwaukee. And that's the only hit he has had this year. I checked that. He had a hit against the Cardinals back on the 12th. Final game of that uh, first homestand. That's the only hit he's had this year. Pirates have been pretty good at the double play ball this year as Locke steps off. And Locke is classified as a ground ball pitcher. Gets more than 50% ground balls versus fly balls.
That's the one thing he does like to do though and he's able to do that is pitch to his glove side. So if you're a left handed pitcher your glove side is the third base side of the home plate. It's easy for a left hander to throw it out there on the first base side a little more difficult for lefties to get it in there. And he's way over on that first base side of the rubber which even makes it tougher on most left handed hitters. So he is in effect coming across the plate to try to get it in there. Yeah, and a left hander is that really accentuates the effectiveness of his breaking ball when he does that. For right handers, not so much. But he can bury a cut fastball in on your hands from that spot. He's been one of the many bright spots for the Pirates in terms of their pitching because the hitting has really not been there for this Pittsburgh team this year, but the pitching. Overall, a 2.79 out of their staff, and even a little bit better than that, 2.67 out of their starters. You know, the Pirates over the last few years have really boasted about being able to bring up farm players, guys that have been drafted and and really raised through their own farm system. Locke is not one of those guys. He actually was drafted in the second round by the Atlanta Braves and was traded to the Pirates in exchange in a deal that brought Nate McLouth down to Atlanta. Also brought Charlie Morton over here, a guy that they're hoping to get back from uh, injuries. Well, I remember a couple of years ago, Morton was so good when he changes rotation around to kind of uh, make him look like uh, Holiday. Remember? He's had all sorts of uh, physical problems since. Tight there, and the groan takes ball two. Check that ball three, and it's a full count. That's a pretty good combination of pitches those last two and this is the starting rotation information on the Pirates. I mean they're first as starters in earned run average opponent batting average and home runs allowed seven home runs allowed as starters. I mean that's off the charts good. So you got the battle then in these two teams against a pitching staff that is very stringent in terms of giving up home run balls against the Reds team. That is hitting the ball out of the park at a record setting pace. Kristen Grone trying to make something out of nothing. He came up there, was asked to bunt, was not able to get one down. Now he's got a 3 2 count, trying to keep the count alive for Brian Pena. Home run by Frazier started this inning, a 1 0 Reds lead. Chance for more with two on and no one out here in the top of two. Well, I'll tell you what. Good eye at the plate for Negron, and Jeff Locke feels like he's thrown at least one pitch. Into that down and in spot that he wishes he had had a, a called strike on. But you see, number eight is the one that was the last pitch. That's the one that missed and sends Chris Negron to first base to load the bases with nobody out. So after the Frazier homer, hit to right by Phillips, hit to right by Bruce, 3 2 walk to Negron, and here's Pena. The base is loaded, nobody out, and a real chance for the Reds now to stretch out what is a 1 0 lead. And you hit in the game on Sunday against Atlanta one for three on the road trip was three out of 11 comes in at 302 He's driven in three on the year. It's interesting to note really that Brian Pena has had about twice as many at bats left handed in his career as he has had right handed. So it's really hard to compare numbers as far as is he better righty or lefty. Although you could always make the argument that most guys who are Natural right handed hitters feel more comfortable at least from the right side. Uh, right now, uh, the comfort level is not being felt by Francisco Cervelli or the pitcher Jeff Locke. They don't like the strike zone of Ted Barrett. Locke comes into this game after two very good back to back outings against the Milwaukee Brewers. Toward the middle, diving stop Walker. They get it out at second and they get it out at first base. Are you kidding me? 
Neil Walker has made two sensational plays out at second base already in this game. I thought when this ball got by the pitcher Jeff Lock, it actually had a chance to find the outfield. But well, Walker is able to backhand it, flip it to the shortstop Mercer, who somehow gets it to first base in time to get Brian Pena. The only saving grace of that is is that Phillips scores. Red stretched the lead to two to nothing. Wow. Bruce is a third with two out in the batter now. The pitcher, a good hitting pitcher in Michael Lorenzen. This guy was an everyday outfielder at Cal State Fullerton during his college days. Late in the game would come on as the closer. And in fact, he had a hit in his first game against Milwaukee. He's at a ball on the strike. You know, Locke is throwing a lot of pitches on the inner part of the plate. If you'll notice where the umpire is, he sits right over the left shoulder of the catcher. And his eyes are right down the line on an inside corner. So he can see that better than any pitch in the zone. That's why it's hard as a pitcher to get a phantom strike called inside off the plate. Because the umpire is right on that line. He never moves. He's always inside, whether there's a left handed hitter up or a right handed hitter up. He's always on that inside line. That's your guy behind the plate from Tech Talk. Ted Barrett. Ted Barrett, yeah. Doesn't get any better than Ted. Lorenzen swings and misses, and Jeff Locke is bailed out in the first and in the second by great defensive efforts by Neil Walker. Routine. I think when I get to do my routine and, and stick to it, um, I feel prepared and, and I go out there and I don't even have to think. I just have to just pound the strike zone with my stuff and, and that's what works for me because I'm just I'm a big routine guy. I'm Jim Day, like many pitchers of his generation, Michael Lorenzen, huge routine guy. In fact, he said that first start that he made, he got himself out of his routine because he didn't know what to expect at the big league level. When he got to the park, he wasn't quite ready to have the meeting with Tucker Barnhart, his catcher that day, didn't get to eat that day, didn't get to warm up long enough in the bullpen. It was a major learning curve. He told me he goes as far as to write on a sheet of paper times he's going to do this. I'm going to eat at this time. I'm going to stretch at this time. I'm going to analyze the hitters at this time. He is as big a routine guy as I have ever found in the game. Well, he has himself a 2-0 lead as we go into the bottom of the second with Neil Walker leading it off. Chris, let's go back a lot of years, 30-some years. 1981, you made your big league debut as a San Diego Padre on the road at San Francisco. Can you remember what the difference was between your first start 
and then a couple of outings later when you made your second start. I was as nervous as could be the first day. It was a packed stadium at San Francisco at Candlestick Park. And I didn't have that great of a line. I think I may have gone four or five innings. And, and as it turned out, I uh, the next time I had to face the Giants in the next start, but I realized, you know what, I better get out there and grind it out. This is a real game here. And if I go out and have another couple games like I did in my first start, I may not get another one. Hard toward left, but Bird, the former Pirate, makes the catch. So from here on, really, for Michael Lorenzen, you know, the debut is done. All the hoopla and the celebration of getting to the major leagues and fulfilling all the promises and so on, that's done. Now he has to concentrate on pitching baseball, getting wins, and grinding out at bats. And really, that's, that's what it comes down to. You don't worry about any of the other stuff. Well, for the record... Your second start was also your first big league win, so let's hope the same thing uh, holds true that for Michael. That would be very nice for Michael if that happened tonight. Starling Marte batting out of the number five spot, playing left field for this Pittsburgh team, which was one of the better hitting teams in the National League a year ago, and yet this year, right near the bottom of the league, they come in 12th. Well, they have, especially in the last series against the St. Louis Cardinals, when they were beaten in the last at bat in St. Louis by the Cardinals in each one of their three games, they left so many men on base. Slice deep to right field and gone, a home run for Starling Marte, their team leader in long balls. That's number seven. You know, I was watching Starling Marte in batting practice, and when he got a ball down in that zone right there, I mean, he put a licking on it every time. And I know batting practice isn't real pitching, but there are some guys that like pitches in certain spots, even if they go against convention. And you think down and away is a safe place to pitch most guys. Maybe not so safe for Marling, uh, Starling Marte. How about Lorenzen now? He's given up four home run balls, but all of them have been solo. He could be the next Robin Roberts. <laughs> You'll have to explain who that. For the longest time, I think it was eventually, the, the record was eventually broken, but he held the record for the most home runs given up by a pitcher in his major league career, and he won 285 games and was in the Hall of Fame. They take that. I think Jamie Moyer uh, eventually, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Moyer uh, who ended up breaking that record. Really based on the fact that Moyer pitched so long into his uh, 40s. Yeah into his 40s. But well, that was a pretty good swing by Marte and. Now a strike out there of Pedro Alvarez for two men out. How, how, how much do you like that about Michael Lorenzo? He gives up a home run and a lot of times a young pitcher gives up a home run. What happens to the next batter? He nibbles around and he walks him. This is a three pitch strikeout right here. He comes right back after Pedro Alvarez and says, here you go. And that's that's very impressive. Well, I think you said it during the uh, the pregame show as that bat goes pinwheeling into the crowd. The high ceiling on this guy, Lorenzen, you have no idea where it could be. You know, there's a lot of interesting things when you analyze the draft pick. Of Michael Lorenz and the Reds got. They got him in the first round. He was the second pick in the round. They had picked up uh, an outfielder before him, Michael Irving, I th Irvin, I think, and and uh, Philip Irvin. But you know, Lorenzen was a two-way player. He played outfielder Cal State Fullerton. He also came in a pitch, but he pitched in relief, so he's never really had that much on his arm as far as wear and tear. And they just thought the fact that he. Had, was a very good athlete, very much like Mike Leake. And the fact that he had a very high ceiling because of his velocity, and he's touched 100 miles an hour along the way, that he would make somewhere down the road a good major league pitcher. I think it was a very good scouting job. The only thing you think about with, with Lorenzen is right now he's throwing all of his fastballs at maximum speed. You know, he's right there at 94, 95, 96. There will be a point at which he'll work at 91 and 92. And save that 95 and 96 when he needs it. I love Johnny Quay. But that takes some time. Well, for the record, he came into this season having only thrown 160 or so innings worth of uh, professional baseball. 20 some more this year at the Louisville before making his big league debut on Wednesday. Well, we just showed you a picture of Johnny Cueto, and that's the guy really that 
Michael Lorenzen on a tail. All year long. Everything Cueto does, Lorenzen should do. Well, maybe we'll see him running the stadium steps soon. And that's a big time routine of Johnny Cueto. Negron makes the play. Inning comes to an end. Into the third we go. Two on red. Live streaming sports service is celebrating 13 years. Watch every out of market game live, real time highlights, live look ins, pitch tracking widget, and more. Blackout and other restrictions do apply. Visit MLB.tv for details. The pitch tracking widget. How about that? Third inning now with a 2 1 Reds lead in this game. Billy Hamilton. Back up there for the second time. Tried to bunt his way on to start this game. Bunted it into the air. Caught by Alvarez. You know, you don't want to have that bunted in the air affect Billy Hamilton down the road. Just because he did that and made his first out, of the first out of the ball game that way, you shouldn't stick it in your pocket and forget about it. That still should be a weapon for him. Or this. Line drive into right. The base hit. Billy's hit a little bit better this year. From the right side than he did a year ago. Seems to be getting more at bats right handed early on this season. Maybe more left handers in the division. Of course, one, of course, the Reds have seen two times. John Lester with the Cubs comes over. We'll keep an eye now on Billy Hamilton. Comes into this game with 13 steals in 14 tries. 12 stolen bases in 12 games at this ballpark. He of course is the only red that has been caught stealing this year. 29 of 30 for the Reds. How about Locke's move, Chris? If you're wondering about the move of Jeff Locke, it's not a great one, but it's good enough to shut down most running games. Last year gave up seven successful thrown out six lifetime 25 up and thrown out 19. Which is pretty good. And you know and it's not the kind of move that is so deceptive that he's going to pick Billy Hamilton off and it's not so quick that he's going to pick him off that way. He but, does have decent pickoff numbers doesn't he. Yeah and, and then those are the numbers I just read but what it what a left hander like Locke will do is throw over maybe one more time than he thinks is necessary and that's the one the runner goes on. And mix in a slide step. Well, you know what the Reds have done as far as stolen bases? They have had 29 of 30. The only one caught was Billy Hamilton. And the Pirates have been caught 12 times. So 
They both try to run. One has run well. The other has not. The Pirates have done a very good job of throwing out would be base stealers this year. This is a good matchup right here. Hamilton. Against the Pittsburgh tandem of Locke and Cervelli. Well, if you're Marlon Bird, you've got to stay calm in the batter's box, but also realize that maybe you're going to get served up a nice fat one if Locke is thinking about Hamilton at first. Pirates pitchers and catchers lead the major leagues with 12 caught stealings. I'll tell you, Marlon Bird to me looks like a completely different hitter when you've got a left handed pitcher on the mound. You know, you're looking at the one on 79 batting average. Majority of the at bats he's had have been against right handers. We've seen him chase high fastballs out of the zone, breaking balls down in the dirt. But against left handers, he's got a calm of, of uh, confidence that you don't see there. Hamilton on the run. The former Pirate Bird hits it high, deep into left, and gone. A home run for Marlon Bird. His fourth of the year comes with Hamilton aboard. And the Reds extend the lead now to four to one. Chris talked about how much more comfortable Bird looks at the plate. He came in at plus 300 against left handers. And he gets the long ball here. He laid off the change up and got a breaking ball down and in and he's strong enough to jolt it right out of here. He was a very important part of this ball club. A couple of years ago when he was traded over here at the end of the summer. So a lot of Pittsburgh fans remember Marlon Bird for all the good things he did for the Pirates. He just did something big time for the Reds. Well, he got off to a horrific start this year, but going into this game, he had been right near 300 over the course of his last nine games. He had a hit taken away in his first at bat on a terrific play by Neil Walker. Rips that bomb in the left center field here with Hamilton aboard making it 4 1 Reds. We talked about the stinginess of this Pittsburgh staff to give up the home run ball. They came into this game having given up only a dozen, the fewest in the big leagues. They've given up two in two plus innings here tonight after having given up only two in over 100 innings prior to tonight. And Votto gets himself a base hit. You know the Reds hit the ball very well in Atlanta except for the last day. They, they even hit the ball pretty well on Sunday. But the first three games of that series I mean they were laying out ropes everywhere. Not all of them fell in for hits. And they continue to come in and swing the bats very well after the off day yesterday. This is a team now that looks like they are much better at the plate here than they were oh, for that little slump uh, right after the beginning of the season began. It's a very dangerous team against left handed pitching because the majority of the power is right handed. And the left handers you do have in the lineup. Votto is a very good hitting left hand lefty on lefty and Bruce has done a lot of home run damage against left handers in his career. Another blast to left field by Frazier. This will stay in the park. And that's the first out here in the top of the third. Well, they are laying some wood on deliveries of one Jeff Locke. Well, the problem for Locke right now is he's not been able to get that change up over for a called strike. So the Reds are laying off of it, waiting for something on the inner part of the plate. And when he misses out over the plate, those are the ones that get hit. Well, it's not often that the Reds have been able to light up Jeff Locke. We mentioned earlier seven career starts, six of them pretty good outings. The only bad one he had was late in the year in 2013. They gave up five runs in one inning in an 11 to 3 loss here in Pittsburgh to the Reds. They've touched him up for four and six hits already tonight. Marte running toward the left field line will get to this ball. Two out. The reminders enjoy a cold one tonight to look forward to our Miller time moment of the game. Later on this evening, brought to you by Miller Lite.
Here's Bruce with Votto aboard. Two out, two in. 4 1 Reds lead here in the third. Shift, of course, employed by the Pirates against Bruce. Just walk away out in shallow right. Yeah, the most dramatic shift you will ever see is the ones that are the ones that Pittsburgh Pirates put on you. Comes into this game with five home runs. You made the uh, the statement earlier, Chris, that he does very well against left-handers. In fact, he has 52 home runs against left-handed pitching since 2010, leading all big league hitters. That means righties and lefties. 52 of them. Yeah. Up oh, and now they got him. Yep. Votto out at first on the pickoff. And the inning is over, but the Reds add two more on the fourth of the year by the former Pirate Marlon Bird. 4-1 Reds. Shock coming into this series. This is what happened over the weekend. Three consecutive one run losses, all in extra innings, all in walk off fashion in St. Louis. Yeah, they were in St. Louis, and boy, they were hooting and hollering up there, those Cardinal fans. And, and Clint Hurdle said, you know what? We played them as well as we can possibly play. We just didn't get big hits when we had runners on base. We left a lot of runners on base, close to 40 runners on base in that series. And that really set them, set them behind. But the Cardinals now, they come in it today with the best record, most wins in all of baseball. They've got 19 wins. And the two teams that you're looking at tonight have a lot of to do with the reason the Cardinals are where they are. I mean, both of these teams have struggled mightily against the Cardinals. Look at the Pirates. They're 8 and 14, yet they own a run to plus differential against the Cardinals. The, the Cardinals I'll tell you about that in a second the Reds are 7 and 15 and they are minus 30 in the run differential. And the run differential is essentially how many runs we scored versus how many runs the other team has scored. But when you have a plus differential and an 8 and 14 record that means the other team has got your number late in the game and Clint Hurdle has lived that horror of a weekend in St. Louis. And well, Reds fans say we feel your pain. <laughs> that series that we mentioned the walk off hits uh, Matt Adams on Friday night a, a walk off base hit in the 11th. 
Matt Carpenter a walk off sack fly in the 11th on Saturday and then Colton Wong the walk off home run Sunday afternoon. You know and I and people will poo poo this and it almost comes along the line of chemistry but I really believe that there are games the Cardinals simply believe that they are going to win more than the other team believes that they're going to win. The other team wants to win the Cardinals believe that they will win. And that's the only way that you can explain the kind of record that the Pirates have against the Cardinals. When the Pirates have scored more runs than the Cardinals yet they're 8 and 14. How do you figure that out? Well case in point. They are 7 and 0 talking about St. Louis since Wainwright. Went on the disabled list with the Achilles injury 7 and 0. There's an off speed pitch by Lorenzen and he gets his second strikeout. Talking about what St. Louis is doing. Here's some other news and notes around Major League Baseball. We congratulate Craig Council on his first big league win yesterday. After the fired Ron Renneke was let go on Sunday night after ironically enough they won those last two games against Chicago. We talked about the uh, the Cardinals their best start in franchise history dating back to 1900 and what about the Cubs. Lost three in a row for the first time but still above 500 after the first month and still in second place. I wonder if I'm going to lose my TV partner my other one Tom Brenneman. There's a big mean, debate on that when Craig Council finds out Tom Brenneman's number he may ask him to be a be his bench coach. Those guys are very close of course when they spend time together in Arizona. And I know that Craig Council very much respects Tom's feel of the game. You never know. Well if you could put up with me and Tom goes down to the bench I'll fill in. All right. Trying to oh. picture Tom Brenneman in a Brewers uniform. Or any uniform for that matter. You're probably going to get a text suit. I think he would be he would look better, I think, with the, the Connie Mac look. The in old in wool. the dugout, which is a, a suit. With oh, a, oh, I got you. Yeah, with a suit with a with a top hat. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah. You could bring some excellent new style to the to the dugout in the major leagues. Just think if if uh, council was tossed out of the game, Tom would be running the ball club. Yeah. Strike three called. Polanco out. One, two, three, third turned in by Michael Lorenzen here in Pittsburgh.
baseball history. You can think about that for a moment. Vote now for Hall of Famer Johnny Bench is one of the greatest living players. Voting ends on Friday, May the 8th. You can visit MLB.com backslash franchise four to cast your ballots. Winners will be revealed during the All-Star Game coming up July the 14th at Great American Ballpark and on Fox. Of course, the greatest four living legends of the Reds, the voting uh, that has been updated as of recently has not changed. Gary Larkin joins the group from the Big Red Machine. Johnny Bench, Pete Rose, Joe Morgan. Bruce was at the plate when Votto was picked off. He leads off here in inning number four. Walker will throw him out. We talked about pitch efficiency in Michael Lorenzen. He threw 107 pitches in five innings a week ago against Milwaukee. Three innings in this game, 38 pitches. Well, he's thrown a lot of strikes, and the Pirates know the, that he will throw strikes, and they're a team that is really swinging a lot. They're not a team that kind of like the Cardinals who will sit back and make you work a little bit. They'll take you deep into the count more so. There aren't too many players on this Cardinal team that will, are willing to do that. They're swingers, and they're up there to wheel that lumber. Grown up there now, Payne on deck, and then Lorenzen. Grown drew a walk back in the second. Way out in front of that off speed pitch, he's down two strikes. The series continues with a couple of night games coming up Wednesday, tomorrow night, and Thursday. We'll get a couple of repeat matchups from the opening series of the season in Cincinnati. Tomorrow night, Mike Leake against Garrett Cole. Cole, by the way, was voted today as the National League Pitcher of the Month for the month of April. And the wrap up on Thursday, Anthony D. Sclafani against A.J. Burnett. Lock throws out the drone. Make sure you're ready for Reds baseball 30 minutes before every game with Reds Live here on Fox Sports Ohio. All the info you need for that day's game. Reds Live presented by Ray St. Clair Roofing. Lock out a one, two, three first. You give up a pair in the second, two more in the third. Aces Payne with two men out, nobody on here in the fourth. And you hit what looked like it was going to be a two run single in the center field back in the second. Save for a terrific play to his right by Neil Walker. Turned it into a 4 6 3 double play. Victory here tonight for the Reds would get them once again back to the 500 mark. These two teams both come in a game under at 12 and 13. Strong throw there by Gung. He gets Pena an 11 pitch inning for Jeff Locke. We go to the bottom of the fourth.
game changer. How about this group of pitchers now? Five innings plus, five strikeouts, one or fewer walks in the Major League debut for the Reds since 1914. Lorenzo joins this group, headed up by Johnny Cueto, the last one to do it, 2008. Jeff Russell's son, we've seen James Russell around a lot for the Cubs. That's our T Mobile game changer. His line so far tonight. Been very impressive. No walks. You love that column right here where he's just simply thrown the ball right over the plate, come right after the hitters. And this shows me that this young man has such a lot of confidence in his stuff that he's not going to nibble around the edges. He'll get two, three, four in the Pirates order. That means Cervelli, the catcher, McCutcheon in center, and Walker, their second baseman. You know, Michael Lorenzen is confident, but he's not cocky. And he was so confident on the fact that the way he pitched in spring training, that he should have been included in that opening day roster, but wasn't. But wasn't going to complain to anybody or pout about it. But he really felt that, you know, he pitched his way onto this ball club. And I think a lot of people that follow this team felt the same way. That's a fair ball. And out at first is Francisco Cervelli. Remember, he was not a 40 man roster player when they called him up, so they had to add him to the roster. And I guess you could make the argument, Chris, that had the, the game that he threw against Milwaukee basically not fallen on his day, things could have fallen to uh, Rysel Iglesias. You're right about that, but you know, had he made the team out of spring training, you're looking at five players that would have been non roster players make the opening day uh, roster for a major league team. Uh, that's almost on, in the unheard of category. But uh, he's happy to be here now. He's throwing the ball very well when he was down in the minor leagues. And hey, Brian Price just has to be just so at ease to see that he's not going to have to go to his bullpen anytime too early because he just looks like he's in control. Mixing in a changeup right there, missing down. And what do you think the feeling is? And, and certainly you don't wish ill will on anyone, but Homer Bailey is now out for the year. He's going to undergo surgery on uh, Friday. Bruce makes a nice running catch of that ball. But what's the feeling the guess from Lorenzen who knew that he wasn't coming up to make one start or two starts and then going back that he was here with an opportunity to really settle in. Well I mean this is what minor leagues are all about. This is why you draft players. This is why you give them big signing bonuses if you think they're special prospects. It's not so that they can spend their days in the minor leagues and the faster you can get them here if they're big league ready the better. And this is a great problem to have. I mean, if Homer Bailey's able to come back from Tommy John surgery, and, and the success rate out of Tommy John surgery now is way over 90%. So you assume that Bailey will be back at some point next year. So you have a veteran right hander in Bailey. You have, you know, Michael Lorenzen. You have Iglesias probably making a step up. You have what we've seen of Anthony DiSclafani. You know, Maybe at that point Tony Singrani would be back in the mix of being a, a starter. You've got a lot of options to choose even with the two free agents that are pitching for the Reds this year to be free agents if it goes that far. If no extension is is made with Johnny Cueto or Mike Leake then you still have a lot of arms from which to choose. Walker lined out to left his first time against Michael Lorenzen. You know, I had a scout tell me after he saw Michael Lorenzen pitch his first game. He says, you know, I haven't seen much at all of Michael Lorenzen, but what I see is of a pitcher that's fairly easy to track. And I'm not so sure that he was right about that. Because I'm seeing these hitters not really getting good swings at him. A couple of them have. McCutcheon hit the ball hard. And of course, Marte hit an opposite field home run. But it's not like they're laying line drives all over the place. By the diving Votto and into right. That was struck well. So you're saying that the scout said he was easy to track or I, hard I, to track? I, I, I didn't, he didn't say easy, but he was. The deception isn't there. And you know that's something that you can work on. 
You can always flash your glove at the hitter a little in a different fashion to add deception. Johnny Cueto has begun to do that over the last few years. Travis Did, Wood would be in that group, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to, to track. Yeah. And I guess really Tony Singrani is a bit that way, isn't he? Well, what I'm saying is that I haven't seen that from Lorenzen. Okay. So I would be in the corner and say, well, he hasn't shown me that he's easy to track because other than the solo home runs, I don't see a lot of hitters in the lineup taking good swings and just not coming up with line drives. But it's interesting to put that in the thought in the back of your mind and see how that plays out. Marte took Lorenzen deep to right center back in the second. He bats here with a runner aboard and two men out. Yeah, and he's pitching around him a little bit right here, missing with a couple of breaking balls, thinking, oh, I, I, you know, that was a good pitch he hit. I better make even a better pitch now. And the problem is he's holding on to it too long. Marte, one of the few Pirates that, from an offensive standpoint, has gotten off to a good start. The home run was his seventh. He had a career high 13 last year. He and Polanco have gotten off to the best starts offensively for this Pittsburgh team. Remember, Polanco last year, after a pretty good start, actually had to go back down to the minor leagues for the last week of August until they called him back up. Marte draws the walk, two on, two out. You know, sometimes a, a catcher has to be as much a pitching coach as a pitching coach. Look at Brian Pena right here showing Michael Lorenzo, hey, you're getting on the side of your breaking ball. I want you on top of the breaking ball. I want downward spin, not side to side spin. And sometimes that's all a pitcher needs to have it click back into gear. Well, he got the first two, Cervelli and McCutcheon. He loses the next two, Walker and Marte, and now deals with the power laden Pedro Alvarez struck him out his first time. Now the two having a problem, so they will get together. You can see the fingertips of Pena. He's still wearing that neon uh, paint or the clip on nails to make it easier for the pitcher to see the signs that he is putting down. Tonight he has white on. We've seen him wear the fluorescent yellows before. Well, it's the only time they've had a runner at second base, and I think Pena just wants to make sure what the sequence is we're going to go to with different signs with a runner at second. Well, it makes it a lot easier to see. 2 0. Oh. Yeah, Pedro Alvarez is not the kind of hitter to take too many 2 0 oh fastballs. If you give him something that he can get the head to, he's going to let it rip. That's why they went with an off speed pitch and now pitch yourself into a 3 0 -oh hole. Talked earlier about the fact that the Pirates had left a lot of base runners on in that Cardinal series. Reds want to add to that total right here with two on, two out. Four pitch walk to Alvarez. Will load the bases. Well, the only thing I don't like about that particular bat is that when he got down 2 and 0, he continued to try to trick him with another breaking ball. At some point, when you're throwing mid 90s, you've got to say, Here it is. I've got a three run lead. I'm not putting anybody else on base, and I'm coming right after you. And it looked like he pitched around Marte. And the same thing for Alvarez when he got behind in the count. Jeff Locke out there, broken up by Ted Barrett, the pitcher. Pitching coach of the Reds jogs off the field. I said Jeff Locke, Jeff Pico. Now a bases loaded opportunity 
A young man from South Korea, Jung Ho Gung. Excellent pitch right there. Gung is a, is a 28 year old. He's got a little bit of power. He showed some power playing over in Korea. That inside fastball is a tough to turn on. They're coming right back in there. It's it hard to center, but Hamilton is there, and the Pirates leave them loaded here in the bottom of the fourth inning. Their first runners left on base in this game. I'm Jim Day. There was a piece of golf royalty on the field before today's game, and some players came around and admired what is a terrific trophy. <laughs> this you're looking at is the U.S. Open Golf Championship trophy, and it's making its rounds. The U.S. Open is played next year at Oakmont, so they're leading up to that and getting some publicity. You see some of the players around it. That's Dick Williams, one of the vice presidents of the Reds, big golfer, Jason Marquis, Mike Leake around that trophy today. And we're excited here on Fox because the U.S. Open is coming to Fox. And you can mark it on your calendars June 18th through the 21st on Fox Sports 1 and on the Big Fox. U.S. Open 2015 at Chambers Bay. Now, the interesting thing about this trophy is Unlike other trophies in sports, and particularly golf, with the Claret Jug for the British Open, the Wanamaker Trophy for the PGA Tour, or the PGA Championship, and the Ryder Cup, this trophy does not have a name. It is just known as the U.S. Open Championship Trophy. And by the way, the first guy to get the picture today was Chris Welsh, awarded that opportunity when you have a recent hole-in-one. You know, Jim, if you look closely on that trophy, you'll see that I scratched out Johnny Miller's name and scratched in mine. Don't tell anybody though. You know we were talking about that trophy up here when I saw it down there in the field earlier and you never ever mentioned that you were the first one that jumped up <laughs> next to it. Never brought that topic. Yeah you know, I'm excited about seeing it on Fox. Of course Joe Buck will be calling to play by play. Greg Norman will be in the booth next to Joe Buck and my good friend Steve Flesh from Northern Kentucky will also be big time in that tournament and, and several of the tournaments that uh, Fox has now uh, Gained uh, control of it, put on their airwave. So, looking forward to that coverage. I want to know if you, like Dick Williams, put on a pair of gloves before you touched that trophy. I did not, no. Dick had the good sense to do that. Well, he's a sensible guy, and I'm not sure when the last time I was accused of being like that. <laughs> Hey, gentlemen, by the way, if you heard me giggling, it was not the fact that the trophy was on the field. Uh, Brandon Phillips was in rare form again, messing with me from the dugout below as I made that report. Um, basically pinching me in an area that makes you laugh. Just put it that way. We didn't think anything of your giggling, Jim. We're used to it.
That's a well, good nickname, Giggling Jim. Well, I'm used to Brandon Phillips messing with me, so it's par for the course. Well, it's nice to know that Brandon feels relaxed enough to mess with Jim Day while the game's going on and uh, having a good time because you don't play any better baseball than when you're relaxed and having a good time. And he does that. A good breaking ball there by Locke to get the strikeout of Hamilton, his second. Two out for Marlon Berg. Well, Bird has seen the ball very well off Jeff Locke, and I mean, he has scalded it twice. Once, of course, left the ballpark for a home run. Locke has set down now seven in a row since the Votto base hit in the left center back in the third. Bird, of course, homer, two run shot back in the third, becoming the first player. First player to Homer here at PNC Park for four different teams. Cubs, Phillies, Reds as a visitor. And as of course a former pirate during the latter stages of 2013. Now he's down a ball and two strikes. Strike three called to make it eight in a row by Locke, who gets strike out to Hamilton and Bird. What an end to the top of the fifth. Giants in the big four game series coming up May 14th through the 17th at Great American Ballpark presented by Congra. Plus make sure you take advantage of the Reds four for forty eight dollar ticket offer for tickets five one three three eight one Reds or visit Reds dot com slash tickets. That's a giant series will be part of the upcoming homestand that also includes a uh, visit from the Atlanta Braves so. Three with Atlanta and then four. I guess you could clarify them now as the surging San Francisco Giants a terrible start which they got off to but going into action tonight they are now having one four in a row a 500 team at 13 and 13 the defending world champions. Frazier on a backhand pick will throw out Jordy Mercer to start the fifth. 
really mention the fact that today is Cinco de Mayo, May the 5th, big Mexican holiday. Not Mexican Independence Day, as a lot of folks think, but uh, any reason, I guess, to celebrate. Why not? If you brush up on your Spanish, so you can uh, head out and order a margarita after the the way go tonight. I did, in fact. You want me to hear you say it? Want to hear me say it? See, si. por favor. I'll take a margarita. Perfect. <laughs> Isn't that good? You have really brushed up on it. I, I, I'm I'm very impressed. Thank you. I wonder what you and Jesse Jackson were doing on the way over here from Cincinnati yesterday, and it was we were wasting away yeah. in Margaritaville. <laughs> I had to ask. Cinco de Mayo celebration of Mexico's victory over the French back in 1862 is actually what it celebrates. Two men out, nobody on for Polanco. Tomorrow, hey, mark your calendar tomorrow, a brand new Reds Weekly. Jim Day catches up with Michael Lorenzen. Zach Cozart has a new mentor. Pete Rose talks about Red center fielder Billy Hamilton. Reds Weekly with Jeff Pecoro and Doug Flynn is all new tomorrow night at 6 before Reds Live on Fox Sports Ohio. Produced by Ron Melanor, a.k.a. Rufus. This is the same situation now that Lorenzen was in in the fourth. He retired the first two. Then a lot of hit, a couple of walks, but was able to get out of it with a gung line drive to center. Looks for his third, one, two, three inning of this game. He's ahead of Polanco, two strikes. Good sharp breaking ball right there with a lot of depth for Michael Lorenzen. He throws that slurvy slider about 82 miles an hour. And by taking that much off the pitch, because you do see some sliders that are thrown in the mid to upper 80s, and they're more very tight sliders uh, with not a lot of downward movement. But by taking that much off of it, it's, it's a combination of a curveball and a slider, and has a lot of downward action. And he should get a lot of swings and misses with that pitch. And he will throw his 70th pitch here on a one-two count to Polanco. And he got it. One, two, three, fifth turned in by Michael Lorenzen, who's now struck out four through five. By your local Ford dealer, Ford, go further. And by Cincinnati Children's, ranking third in the country on U.S. News and World Report's Best Children's Hospital. Beautiful scene from high above PNC Park here in Pittsburgh. Michael Lorenzen after a 1-2-3 fifth. Look at this, Chris. 
A little conversation well, with Cueto. Well, starting pitchers hang out together. There's no doubt about that. And Johnny Cueto, something saying something to Michael Lorenzo to get a little reaction from. Lorenzo looks relaxed, doesn't he? I mean, for a young man that is only making his second major league start, he just looks like he's been around here for five or six years. I think that is one of the most. One of the things that really stood out most to me about Michael Lorenzen in spring training was the way he carried himself. There are a lot of guys down in that camp that throw hard. Uh, but Lorenzen was a step up just because he he looked like a big leaguer. He kind of passed the eyeball test. How about a 37 pitch differential between his first five inning outing against Milwaukee last Wednesday. And his five innings here tonight, he's at 70. He'll take this anytime. And that's a good at bat by Joey Votto to get it going. Four pitch walk puts Votto on for the second time tonight. Votto's been on base now in 23 of the 26 Reds games this year, including the first 15. The Frazier opposite field home run that came back in the second inning, his fifth home run in his last 31 ABs, his fifth hit also in his last 31 ABs. That was back again in the second. He lined out in the third, and he'll get a base hit here in the left center field in the sixth inning. Votto eyeballs it up and turns the corner. He'll end up at third, so a rally now by the Reds trying to add to a 4 1 lead with two on. And nobody out. That ought to get some action in the Pirates bullpen. I would be surprised if Clint Hurdle didn't have, didn't have somebody getting ready to warm up here. This is the game that can get away from the Pirates quickly and really fall in the Reds' favor if, and he's going to get on the horn right now. Because you've still got some thump coming up here for the Reds in the next few hitters Brandon Phillips, Jay Bruce. Now with the runner 90 feet away at the very least the red score Votto from third. Jared Hughes appears to be the right hander up and throwing now in the Pittsburgh bullpen. Ball one to Phillips. Now he and Cervelli talking about Jeff Locke will get together. Notable game tonight for Brandon Phillips. This is the 1,349th game of his Reds career, breaking a tie for 10th with Roy McMillan. 1,349 games for Brandon Phillips, wearing a Reds uniform, 10th all time. He will surpass later this year Ed Roush for 9th. Pete Rose, of course, number one. Got a ways to catch Pete. He's not even halfway to Pete. To third, and oh. they've got the runner Votto off the bag. Savelli will put on the tag. Joey broke to his right when he should have broke back to the base. That'll go 5 2 and a put out of Votto, who was picked you know, off earlier. A play like this can be avoided if you simply ask yourself before the pitch is thrown what happens if? If a ball gets hit back to the pitcher, what do I do? If a ball gets hit right down the third baseline, what do I do? Those are the kind of things that base runners sh should be asking themselves uh, to avoid that. Now a double play ball will get the Pirates out of the inning with nobody coming in to score. Bad night in the bases for Votto, as we mentioned earlier, picked off in the third at first, and now base running blunder. In the sixth over third. Bruce is single, grounded out, he's one for two. Month of April, of course, was not a good one for Jay. From an average perspective, they'll take the five homers, 13 RBIs, but the 181 averages. Far below what he had hoped for, what the Reds faithful had hoped for. 
Well, the Pirates can't shift him like they normally do. Walker, the second baseman, has to play him in more of a conventional spot, and that opens up a little bit more of the right side if Bruce wants to hit one on the ground. I mean, in a shift situation, this is where Walker plays. But, of course, with a double play situation, you come down and you're playing a little bit into double play depth, although he's not going to cover the bag anytime. You know what we've seen with Jay over the years and those home runs that you mentioned him hitting off of left handed pitching. A lot of those have come on hanging breaking balls and this is a count. That you would expect that he might get a breaking ball right here. There it is and a foul ball. So two and two. Well he missed a couple of times with fastballs down. Missed badly on the previous pitch with a fastball down and away. So, in order to kind of keep changing speeds, adding and subtracting, that would indicate now's a good time for a hook. And he got one and just couldn't do much with it. Jay has not had a lot of success against Locke Lifetime. Three for 17. He'd love a big one right here with two on and one out. Hammers it, but fouled on the right field side. Might be the last one of those he gets in this at bat. First of a three game series here in Pittsburgh. First of three visits this year to Pittsburgh for the Reds. They'll be here in late June and again to close the regular season in September. Boy, Jay thought that was a little below the knees, and they'll say something to Ted Barrett as he is rung up. Well, it looked like, are you sure that was a strike, Ted? And Ted, you can see nodding his head. You take a look right here. I think that maybe Jeff Locke had the benefit of a, a little frame job by Cervelli. Tough break for Bruce, and now it's up to Negron with two on and two out. This inning started with a walk to Votto and a hit to left center for Frazier. There's two on nobody out now. It's two on two out. Great spot for Negron. It was one for 24 on the year. Over his last 22, come up with a big hit. Young man really came up out of necessity last year to this team. And hung with the ball club the rest of the year after coming up in July. And did a pretty good job from an offensive standpoint. Hitting 271 and 144 at bats. Plays everywhere. He started now this year at first, second, short, third, and center. A couple of guys that he beat out for an opening day roster spot down in uh, Louisville doing pretty well. Irving Falou swinging a good bat down there. Ivan De Jesus Jr. both hitting the ball very well for the Louisville bats. Um, Chris Grone really showed so much in spring training from a, from a hitting standpoint, from a versatility standpoint, but I think overall from the general excitement standpoint. I mean, he brought energy to the team when he was in the ball game. And the Reds knew that and I think what we've seen here in the last couple of years despite the fact that he's one for what you say one for 24. I mean as a, as a backup player it's just hard to get a bat to get out of a slump. But the guy comes ready to play. And that's really what you ask your utility guys to do. You don't expect your utility guy to come off the bench in 350. I mean it's nice when that happens but it rarely does. Certainly nobody enjoys it more. Nobody appreciates it more than a guy like Negron. And Skip Schumacher in the same category there. Reds have several of them, and, but they really show it. Nice short hop pick and the out at second base. Mercer makes the play. Reds leave two, lead by three in the middle of the sixth.
Sports Ohio is brought to you by Meyer, by your local Ford dealer, Ford Go Further, and by Cincinnati Children, ranking third in the country on U.S. News and World Reports, Best Children's Hospital. From across the river in downtown Pittsburgh, at the Allegheny, looking over to the ballpark. You know, this ballpark not that far away at all and I'm talking about probably what half a mile maybe from old three rivers stadium the end of Point Park I guess it would be out to the Allegheny and take a right I'll be on the right field wall right to Negron throws out Cervelli Chris, we were talking earlier about the comparison between Negron, rather, uh, uh, Lorenzen start Wednesday against the Brewers and this one tonight against Pittsburgh. Now, this is what nerves will do for you in your major league debut. Will, you know, you're rear back and you're trying to throw harder than you can really throw. In the process, you'll give up more runs. He gave up three earned runs and home runs. And tonight he's been much more efficient, just much more relaxed and giving the Reds what they need. Boy, that's a beautiful pitch right there. Nice little get ahead breaking ball. I mean, a hitter like Andrew McCutcheon is not going to waste his at bat swinging at that pitch. Because he's up there looking for a first pitch fastball. He got one his first time up, he hit a ground ball to shortstop. Second time up, he hit a, a line shot to Jay Bruce. He's another reason why the. The Pirates are struggling a little bit. People are talking about Josh Harrison about the, the slow start that he has had, but McCutcheon's batting in the he's still on the interstate. Batting 180 something. Started the game at 193. He's a bit below that now. I mean, you're talking about a pirate club who was in the top two or three in the National League and hitting last year. The National League batting race went Justin Morneau of Colorado one, Josh Harrison of the Pirates two. Andrew McCutcheon of the Pirates three. And both those two Harrison and McCutcheon below 200 now a month into the season. Great pitch right there. McCutcheon is not the kind of hitter to give up on those inside fastballs very early. You can see him getting his hands ready to swing and bounce back out of the way just in time. In the air but it'll be handled by Billy Hamilton. Two out. Remember to stay with us after the game. This one and every Reds game here in Fox Sports Ohio. For Reds Live post game brought to you by Performance Kings Honda. Complete recap of the game. Interviews from the locker room. Thoughts from the manager Brian Price. Reds Live post game right after we're finished up here. Now Neil Walker stands in the way of a fourth one two three inning tonight for Michael Lorenzen. Walker's lined out and singled. Can get Walker in the next two or three pitches. He'll be right around 85 pitches through six. He's due up second in the seventh inning. I don't think there's any doubt that he would go back out there in the seventh. Do you? He's hit, he hits Walker here, so he's on with two out. Well, he's, he's strong right now, and of course, Brian Price is thinking that the best bridge right now to a roll to Chapman would be Michael Lorenzen. <laughs> And I hit that of her a little bit going in the mid 90s. You know, going back to the Pirates in their offense, I'm watching Andrew McCutcheon, and it just seems to me that, that he's just not right. And that's probably one of the reasons why the Pirates have been struggling so mightily offensively. I mean, he's missed some time in spring training and early in the year with, you know, lower body soreness, whatever that means. You can translate that into knee 
ankle, thigh, groin, whatever it is. But I mean, but that's what they say when they don't really want anybody to know exactly what it is. But when you get the MVP of the league hitting one, you know, a, a buck 80, and it's in May, uh, it's hard to think that this guy's actually healthy. A bobble by Frazier, but a recovery in time to throw out Marte. And a relatively easy inning from Michael Lorenzen. He's allowed one run through six. Every Tuesday on Reds Live pregame, we're going to give you snippets or a chunk of my interview with Pete Rose. And speaking of Pete Rose, he's our subject of our Miller Time moment brought to you by Miller Light. There's a big date in the history of the Hit King. Take you back to May 5th, 1978. Peter Edward against the Expos pitcher Steve Rogers, hit number 3,000. And there you see Tony Perez, big dog there greeting him at first base. It was a big night at Riverfront Stadium and that night was a la Pete Rose because the hit before that hit number 2999 he hustled out an infield hit and that one a clean single a line drive to left which he would duplicate on hit number 4192 to break Ty Cobb's record and of course finishes the all time hit king record 4256 hits. I bet that was a lot of fun to sit down with Pete and do that interview Jim Day. It really was. Uh, we did 90 minutes with him. 90 uh, minutes. 90 minute interview with him, and I hope everyone's enjoying the chunks we've been giving you every Tuesday night on Reds Live. Literally, I could have I could have sat there all day and all night. There is no one better to talk about baseball than Pete Rose. It was the best, most enjoyable interview I've ever done. To the mound off the bat of Payne, who's had some tough luck tonight against Jeff Locke for the first out in the seventh. Well, Jim Day, 90 minutes with Pete Rose, you probably heard about 5% mm, of his stories. He had some good ones, man. He had some good ones before we started rolling and after <laughs> we started rolling, too. You know, the ones that you can't quite air. Yeah. He is the greatest storyteller on earth. Absolutely right. I can tell you this. I, for one, have loved watching the snippets of the interview. They've been good stuff, really good stuff. Now Michael Lorenzen stays in this game, bats for himself here in the seventh. He has struck out, grounded out. He's 0 for 2. He's thrown 83 pitches through six. A lot of run on two hits. That was the home run ball by Marte in the second. Well, he batted for himself, if I'm not mistaken, after he was decided by Brian Price to be out of the game. I want to say it was the bottom of the fifth inning uh, back in Cincinnati. The Reds were down 2 to 1 at that point. And it raised some eyebrows as to why you'd bat him when the Reds were down. They thought that Michael Lorenzen, who had his first major league hit in his first major league at bat, would stand the chance of getting the base hit. Swings the bat well. But as as well as he hit, and here are those numbers at Cal State Fullerton as an outfielder. 335, seven home runs, 53 driven in, 19 saves. But he doesn't take as much batting practice, obviously, now as the regular players do. 
So but, I would think that this is an indication that he's in the ball game. That and the fact that there's nobody up in the Reds bullpen. In that game on Wednesday against Milwaukee, Jim Day, I know you got a chance to talk with his mother for a long time. Yeah, and unfortunately, it came during a time which he gave up a home run, which kind of made national news, and we had a chuckle about it. But it was a big day for Cheryl Lorenzen because after the game, he gave her a number of items from that game his first strikeout, his first put out, uh, his first hit ball, as well as the lineup card from that game. So it was a big day for mom and son. And multiple videos taken by every one of the Lorenzen family that were there at the ball game. Everybody had their camera phones up and taking the full video. And I think didn't we have a video of him talking with Adam Lind at first base asking Lind if he had the home run ball that he gave up the first home run that he'd given up as a big leaguer. Lind didn't have it. It's hard to catch your own home run ball. That was way back in the second inning of that game. Adam Lind has been a rare bright spot for that Milwaukee team so far this year, hasn't he? They've had a lot their of people struggles. don't know about him, but he's had a pretty good career in the American League for a while, and he may, you know, I don't know whether he'd be one of the pieces that if if they don't turn around quickly, will they start to trade players? That's a question mark. But I got to figure that they will be a better team the next time the Reds see them, which will be the weekend of July the fourth. I mean, no one can be as bad as the Brewers have been so far in the season. Things are about to change, and you're going to start trending back to. To normal back to the mean. I think I saw a projection today if they continue to play the way they are playing they would lose something like 117 games. Craig Council never having coached never having managed anywhere long time big league player solid baseball guy though takes over as a skipper of that Milwaukee club and they won on opening his opening game. And in the process, defeated Clayton Kershaw. McCutcheon tracks this ball by Hamilton. And the Reds go in order for the fourth time tonight. Stretch time in Pittsburgh. 4 1 Reds. Offer that's May 14th through the 17th, thanks to Reach Savings Magazine for only $48. You can get four tickets, four Reds hats. Cheer on your Reds and save for tickets 513 381 Reds or visit Reds.com slash four for 48. That's that series against the San Francisco Giants we're talking about. 
coming up in the middle of May 14th through the 17th at Great American Ballpark. Lorenzen back to work here. Meanwhile, double barrel action out in the Reds bullpen. Lefty Tony Singrani. Right hander Jumbo Diaz. It's a good idea to get both those guys going. They are both go to pitchers, one from either side, because you don't want the inning to go so quickly and get away from you too quick before you get somebody warmed up. A little preemptive work right there. Alvarez has struck out and walked. Lorenzen has walked to fan four. And he's on for the second time with a leadoff base hit. That marks the first time in seven innings the Pirates have had the leadoff man on. Here's Gung. Pirates go to South Korea to get this guy, sign him. To a four year, $11 million deal. Nine years in the big leagues down in Korea. Chris talked about last year the incredibly impressive numbers he put up 40 homers, 117 RBIs. Well, he's a five time Gold Glover, five time All Star in that league. He led the league in slugging percentage last year. So at 28, the, the Pirates figured, well, we're, we're not sure exactly how the Korean baseball, you know, corresponds to Major League Baseball, but we're getting a guy at 28 years old who's at his athletic prime, or at least baseball prime. What you don't see over here is all that that much is that leg kick that you see Gung taking right there. You tell me if I'm wrong on this. I've talked to some people who have gone over to Korea to play and they say that the ball is just a little bit smaller over there. Have you heard that? I don't know. Wait till he sees it coming from a roll Chapman. It'll look real small. Yeah. Here's a leg kick we were talking about it. You know, you see a lot of Asians do that. But the interesting thing there, if we can see that one more time. Uh, when we get a break is that when he gets that leg kick he actually points the barrel of the bat to the pitcher and that really lengthens your swing and makes it tough to catch up to a real fast fastball. A ball four. So a walk follows a hit. I got to figure that the leash on Michael Lorenzen is going to be awfully short. You've gotten a lot out of him tonight probably as much as you expect if not more. And Brian Price making his way out of the dugout right now. Corey Hart on deck to bat for the pitcher lock, but we have seen Michael Lorenzen throw his last pitch, 93 of them here tonight, leading four to one. Brian Price will take the baseball from the 23 year old right hander Lorenzen. Time for our Skyline Chili. Call to the bullpen as the Reds make the pitching change into the game will come the big man Jumbo Diaz.
podcast is presented by authority of the Cincinnati Reds and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Cincinnati Reds. Michael Lorenzen getting the glad hand in the dugout. He could, Reds hang on here, come up with his first big league victory. Boy, I tell you what, he's pitched like he has deserved it. No question about that. He is responsible for the runners at first and second, and that will lie on the responsibility of Jumbo Diaz, who comes in now for the Reds for the 11th. 11th time overall. He's pitched eight and two thirds innings. Got roughed up a little bit last time he pitched against the Brewers. He gets Mercer first pitch swinging fly ball to center. The runners will stay put. Billy Hamilton with that big arm gets the ball back in in a hurry. Jumbo one pitch one out and now a pinch hitter. The former big time slugger of the Milwaukee Brewers Corey Hart. That's for lock. of the time that Hart has had this year has been off the pirate bench. He's hitting 200 four for 20 with a homer. He's driven in four. He does have a pinch hit home run three for eight off the bench. Boy, a couple of really sharp breaking balls right there. Before Corey Hart can even get loose. He's down 0 2. Hart has never faced Jumbo Diaz before. This is a guy, Hart, from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Went to Greenwood High School in Bowling Green. And we mentioned he's had some big years with the Milwaukee Brewers. Two time All Star, Corey Hart, back in 08 and again in 10. What a great pitch on an 0 2 count right there. You're throwing two breaking balls in. You come up and in with a fastball, and you set up something on that low outside corner right here. To Frazier, step out, throw out, double play. Just what the Reds and Jumbo Diaz, and yes, Michael Lorenzen wanted right there. Double play puts an end to the bottom of the seventh.
Montgomery. A couple of long balls for the Reds. This one by Todd Frazier. His league leading ninth of the year. And the second made it one nothing Cincinnati. Marlon Byrd, meanwhile, the former Pirate. A two run shot in the third made it four to one Reds. And that's the offense in this game so far. And then the young man at 23 years old, Michael Lorenzen, looking for victory number one in the big leagues. There's the line. One run on the home run ball by Starling Marte. Three hits, three walks, four strikeouts, 93 pitches. And he is two innings away from notching Major League victory number one, a Honda game summary. Well, the Reds would like to play a little add on as they go into the top of the eighth inning and still have the two, three, four hitters. They'll face another pitcher, Jared Hughes. 15 games now for Hughes, having a pretty good start on the season. Hughes on a relief of Locke, who goes seven, allows four runs, seven hits, two walks, five strikeouts, 101 pitches. Hughes is a big dude. 6'7, 245, gives you long arm action, a little bit of a low three quarter delivery. Just a tremendous year a year ago. Mm -hmm. Jared Hughes, sub two. 63 games. He was a workhorse. This year he leads the big league in appearances. This is number 15, as Chris mentioned. Broken bat. Mercer will make the play. Bird is out at first. Yeah, one thing about Bird, I mean, even though the fact that he's off to a slow start. He has not one time not hustled down the line when he's hits a ground ball or a pop up. Well, he's one for four tonight. Hit the ball hard twice. Two run homer back in the third against his former club, the Pittsburgh Pirates. First quit swinging Votto. And he's on for the third time with his second hit. He's on with one out. Remember Fox Sports Live will get you caught up on a full night of NHL and NBA playoff action plus highlights of tonight's Major League Baseball games. You can see Fox Sports Live tonight at 11 on Fox Sports 1 and simulcast on Fox Sports Ohio. Here's Frazier. I'm running a single tonight, but more importantly for Frazier, three at bats, no strikeouts, three hard hit balls. Maybe the worm, so to speak, turning for him tonight. Well, his mom and dad drove in from New Jersey today. So sometimes having his dad around, Charlie comes around to a lot of the games that that Todd Fripp plays in and Maybe brings a little luck. Maybe give him a little instruction here and there. Yeah, we see him in Cincinnati certainly a lot. Complaining about that truck traffic on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. I hear you. Well, he likes talking about Frazier, likes playing against the Pirates, loves playing in this ballpark. That home run he hit back in the second inning, his sixth here at PNC, the most he has hit anywhere away from Cincinnati. McCutcheon takes care of him here for the second out. Phillips will bat with Votto aboard and two out. He is singled, flied out, hit into a ground ball, oh, out. Brandon is hit hitless in the game on Sunday, 0 for 2, although he did reach base twice via the walk. 
significant in the fact that he had had three straight two hit games. Those couple of games he played in Atlanta last game at home against Milwaukee. He was sick remember the first game of the uh, the Atlanta series in his hometown. Two and two now to Phillips. Bruce is on deck. Lorenzen six plus a run on three hits. Jumbo Diaz faced two batters, got three outs thanks to the double play hit into by Corey Hart. Reds will take at least a three run lead into the bottom of the eighth. Looking to stay perfect against the Pirates so far this year. Towards center, that's going to be a hit for Brandon, his second hit of the night. Votto stops at second base. Reds get their ninth hit. Well, what it is about. Jared Hughes that Brandon Phillips likes. He's now five for ten lifetime against him. And wasn't it a couple of years ago that the two of them uh, exchanged some quote pleasantries? Wasn't it Phillips with Hughes? I think you might be right about that. You would not think though, just looking at the setup. Hughes six seven right handed low arm delivery. He's the kind of guy to freeze right handers in the batter's box. Uh, you wouldn't pick him as Brandon's more favorite pitcher to to hit against. But evidently the numbers. Show that to be true. Now you would pick a guy like Jay Bruce, who would hit Hughes. Jay two for eight, lifetime, against the big right-hander. Yeah, I really believe, and the more I see it happen, the more I believe that right-handed pitchers ought to pitch. Even against left handers from the third base side of the of the rubber. It just gives your angle a lot better if he wants to bore in there. He's way on the first base side. And he's given away about 16 inches of deception. We didn't get a comment on it but I think that's where Michael Lorenzen pitches on that third base side. A lot of pitchers don't do it because they have a hard time getting the ball in there. Hughes's case in on lefties. He's about as far removed on that first base side as you can get. Only his toe is on the on the rubber. Yeah, that's actually an adjustment made to the rule book just a few years ago. It used to be that your entire foot had to be in contact with that rubber, so it would really be there. But now they changed the rule a couple of years ago where any part of your foot can be in contact with the front of the rubber and you're okay. Bruce takes strike three according to Ted Barrett. Reds leave a couple and stranded five as they go to the bottom of the eighth.
the Reds at GABP. First 25,000 fans get a Johnny Bench Stars of the Queen City bobblehead. It's presented by John Morrell. 513-381-REDS. Select Kroger locations or reds.com slash ticket. Let's give you an update on Zach Cozart. Christopher Negron playing shortstop tonight. It was a rough game Saturday in Atlanta. Percy hit, hit by a pitch in the first inning of that game. Stayed in the game and then later on took this right off of his index finger. Now talking to Zach today, he said that he left the stadium Sunday in Atlanta and his wrist was fine, but he woke up the next day and it was hurting him big time. So much so that he cannot swing the bat right now. And his index finger, he can't throw the ball right now. He was, in fact, walking around in the clubhouse before the game today, guys, holding a baseball, just trying to will his brain into thinking that he could throw it. But he is hurting on two levels. One, he can't throw the ball, and one, he can't swing. So tomorrow, kind of up in the air whether he'll be back in there. Wow, that's uh, that's really bad news for the Reds, considering you have Mezzarocco, who can't play his position. Now you have Cozart, who cannot play his position. At least Mazzarocco can pinch it. Those are really uh, unable to play, it sounds like. New pitcher is Tony Singrani, his eighth appearance of the year. Jumbo Diaz did his job, and now Tony Singrani works the bottom of the eighth. He did a good job on Saturday, didn't he, against the uh, the Braves in this spot? Yeah, I think he's really settling in. I also think the Singrani sees the opportunity right there in front of him of being the bridge. We've talked to him about it before to a role as Chapman into tight ball games. I mean, there have been a lot of pitchers that have been auditioned. And this is what Tony Singrani came in and did Saturday. That was against the Atlanta Braves, an inning and a third. Of shutout hitless baseball. You got Marquez to end the seven. Gets Kiaspo on strikes. Gets Freeman on strikes. Gets the ground ball out of AJ Pierzynski. So he faced four, retired four on Saturday in that 8 4 Reds win, working the eighth inning. You know, this is one of those innings where you can start the debate about closers and how you use your closer or your best pitcher on your team. Singrani's facing the top of the lineup. So, say he gets he goes through four guys and gets three outs. And he may go through three guys and get three outs. That would be the ideal thing. But I, but I mean, then you start seeing a drop off of production after you get past number four. You go five, six, and seven. So you bring your closer in, your best pitcher on your team, to essentially face the bottom of the lineup, whereas your setup guy is facing the hardest part. And managers have been talked to, you know, have been bantering about this for years as to how is the best place to use them. And really, a lot of it is predicated on. The stat called the save. If there wasn't such thing as a save out there, I really believe that you'd see managers using their bullpens in a different manner in many, many times. Uh, interesting concept right there. Certainly not new, but it's worth talking about from time to time. Cervelli over three in that number two spot. After saving that game on, after pitching, I should say, the eighth inning so successfully on Saturday, Brian Price was asked about Tony Singrani and his approach, and does he have the uh, the necessities to be maybe a closer down the road? And he is certainly, he said, from a mental standpoint, he thinks he is that kind of a guy. Of course, the Reds don't need anyone like that right now with. A roll is Chapman. He needs a strike now. And he gets it as the batter, Cervelli, had stepped out but did not get time granted to him by Ted Barrett. Well, uh, the two important things for being a late inning guy is you come in, throw strikes, and number two, you keep the ball in the ballpark. Ball four. Now, even when he is not 100%, Andrew McCutcheon comes out of the category of extremely dangerous. And he's clearly not 100%. Whether it's his knee, his leg, his hip, his ankle, I'm not sure what's bothering him. 
Well, I can guarantee you one thing. He's looking for a piece of cheese to turn around, and he figures that from Singrani, that will be the pitch of choice. Jeff Pico talks it over with Tony Singrani as a oldish Chapman who has not worked in a week. Last Tuesday against the Brewers gets up, starts to throw in the bullpen. And really the question is, I mean, there's no other bridge that you're going to put in there right now to get to Chapman. So if Singrani fails on the task, you're going to go to Chapman in the eighth inning. Ground ball gets you out of this inning. First pitch swinging and a pop up. Brandon Phillips will handle that off the bat of McCutcheon. So Andrew 0 for 4 tonight. Not too out for the switch hitting Neil Walker. And he got a lot of his at bats out in a hurry. McCutcheon did. Clearly not 100 percent but. Still playing every inning. Well, if anything else, he's lighter this year because of the uh, the loss of the hair. Got rid of all those dreadlocks. Had him uh, cut off for charity during spring training. Remember what happened to Hercules? You're just throwing that out there. Runner aboard, two out. Walker tonight one for two was hit by a pitch in the sixth inning by Lorenzen. If Cervelli had had a lead at all he may have been picked off. But I think his foot was on the back the entire time. Standpoint, this is the side you want to see Walker hitting on. His power comes batting left handed. He had 23 home runs last year, 21 of them batting left handed. There's only one this year is from the left side. Came against the Brewers. Cervelli now will be on the move from first as Votto moves off the bag. Three and two with a runner aboard and two out. Red trying to protect a 4 1 lead in the bottom of the eighth. And it's in the air to right. Bruce drifting that way. And the inning is over. Nice work by Tony Singrani. We'll go to the ninth in Pittsburgh. 4 1 Reds.
That's what we have tomorrow night for you. Mike Leake against Garrett Cole. We mentioned earlier that Cole has been named the National League Pitcher of the Month for the month of April. 4-0 with a 176. But Mike Leake is pitching pretty darn well himself, isn't he? Well, he is, and he's certainly up to the task. But he has taken on the number one starter that the Pirates have. And they put a lot of faith in Garrett Cole when he comes out. He'll throw the ball tomorrow a lot like Michael Lorenzen threw it tonight. Mid to high 90s, sharp breaking ball. But certainly a stud right-handed pitcher, and we've got a pretty good matchup coming your way tomorrow. Here we get the third pitcher of the night for the Pirates. This is the former Philly, Antonio Bastardo. Acquired in an off-season trade. Appeared in a career-high 67 games a year ago for Philadelphia. Has appeared nine times this year with a 360. Grown leads off here in the top of the ninth. Jim Day, you have something on the red shortstop. Oh, he wears number 17, and it's a number that he wore in his childhood. He wore it in high school. He wore it all through the minor leagues. And when he got up to Cincinnati and found number 17 in his locker, he was so excited. Went to clubhouse manager Rick Still and said, Thank you very, very much for giving me my number, my favorite number. And Rick Still said, Son, it was just random. Some think Rick Stowe has a sixth sense about this. This has not been the first time that he has given out a number, and it happens to be the favorite number of a player, but it fell on Christopher Negron, and he will certainly take it. A rocket in the left field as we talk about the red shortstop, and that's a base hit for Negron. Christopher had been 0 for 2 tonight. He breaks an 0 for 23 streak with that base hit. Good to see. Well, I got a feeling we're looking in the dugout and seeing Zach Kozar with a wrap around his wrist and Negron may get some opportunity to play regularly here for the next few days until Kozar can get back in playable shape. You know the same story now will start to develop about Kozar if he doesn't start to feel better in the next two or three days as to whether he should or shouldn't be placed on the disabled list. Well, you know, it's always a fine line of ball club walks on that because you're reluctant to put a guy on the disabled list if he's going to be better, you know, five days earlier than you than he would be able to come off the disabled list and be eligible to play. So you've got to go by what the player says. You've got to go by what the trainers and if he's seen a doctor, what the doctor says. Uh, it's a tough call, and sometimes teams can get caught a few players short because of that. And a lot of times you don't want to let that out there. And that was one of the reasons why Brian Price had an explosive interview uh, with a bunch of reporters one day is because, you know, he thought that there were secrets being let out that we're trying to keep the fact that this guy was not available quiet so the other team doesn't use it to their advantage. And sometimes it gets out and sometimes it backfires. So the Reds right now, everybody knows around baseball that Devin Mesoraco can't catch. So. You know the players are one defensive player short, but they can use them at the bat. Bunt by Pena is going to move the runner along. Alvarez put the tag on. That's a three unassisted sacrifice for Brian Pena. And now speaking of the man that was the at the center of that firestorm by Brian Price at that uh, media meeting in Milwaukee. A couple of weeks ago, Devin Mesoraco will pinch it here for Tony Singrani. A big weekend coming up for this guy, Devin Mesoraco, as the Reds play the first of their 20 interleague games against the Chicago White Sox as to whether he will be able to designate a hit in those games. Jim Day talked about it earlier. He's certainly going to be apparently the DH in that first game on Friday as to whether he can do it in back to back to back games. Remains to be seen. Been shooting for the sixth time since he strapped on the catching gear on April the 12th at home against the Cardinals. 0 for 3 with a couple of walks. And overall in the year for Devin Mesoraco, tough beginning, 2 for 24. Tony Singrani in the inning, a walk. Chapman ready in the bullpen. 
Right now it's a safe situation. The Reds had another run here. And it would no longer be that situation. Runner going to third. And a stolen base. Great jump by Negron gets him third base. Well, for some reason, it's always been easier to steal third base off left handed pitchers. Maybe it's because they don't see you running. Although you can see the second baseman Walker jumping up and down saying, hey, go back here. Good jump by Negron. Important jump because now 90 feet away, they've got to bring the infield in. A fly ball gives the Reds a little bit of an insurance run. Is Christopher's first steal of the year gives the team its 30th and 31 tries. You know, I was looking at the schedule. We're talking about the interleague schedule starting on Friday against the White Sox. The Reds played 20 interleague games this year, and they split them down the middle in terms of home and away in a row. The first 10 are all on the road. The last 10 are all at home. The White Sox in Kansas City and Cleveland upcoming. Later in the season at Detroit and then they have Detroit Minnesota Cleveland and Kansas City coming back to Great American. Sounds like you've had a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> well remember I drove over here with Jesse Jackson. I was driving. Scouring the media guy. <laughs> That's multitasking mm -hmm. there. Jesse was multitasking too. He was riding and sleeping. Two of his favorite things to do. <laughs> that and eat a good fish sandwich. He loves himself some fish sandwiches. Yeah, boy, Devin Masaraka would love nothing better than to get a hold of one right here in his home state. He will take ball four. So as a pinch hitter this year, he walks for the third time. We'll turn the task over to Billy Hamilton representing the top of the Reds order. The start of this year has now walked four. In five plus innings. A couple of years ago he was. Unhittable as a Philly. Terrific year in 2011. Terrific year in 2013 for the Phillies. Not so much last year. And a trade in the offseason brings him over here to Pittsburgh. One end of the state of Pennsylvania to the other. Here's Billy Hamilton. He has a hit tonight. One for four. Red scored two in the second solo home run by Frazier. Run produced on a double play ball hit into by Pena and then two more in the third on a two run homer by Marlon Bird. Trying to add to that total here in the ninth leading four to one. Roller, that's going to be an infield base hit and an RBI for Billy Hamilton. No way they're going to get the speedy outfielder on that ball. That starter just picked it up, put it in his pocket. Give Billy an RBI his fourth. Well, I'll give Christopher DeGroat a lot of credit for this run being scored because had he not stolen a third base, you don't score from second on an infield hit. And Billy Hamilton can even look back a couple of times knowing that they're not going to get him on that. Boy, if you can only do that at will. 
A swinging bunt may be one of the best weapons that Billy Hamilton has. So the Reds now slam range right at the edge of it. 5 1 advantage. Bird shoots one to the gap in right center. That will get down, go to the wall, will clear the bases. Here comes Hamilton chasing the runner around Mesoraco. Both of them touch the plate. It's now seven to one as Marlon Bird is at a four RBI game. He came into this game with nine runs batted in. He has 13 now, and it's seven to one Reds. Well, Bird off a left hander again, and it's a different, different really. Look at the plate for Marlon when he's got a southpaw on the mound and he drives this ball to right center field. He was studying video before the ball game tonight, trying to figure out what the Bucks were going to do with him, how he was going to handle it, what his swing looks like, and seemingly coming around a little bit. No save situation now for Arolis Chapman. Although he is still out there in the Reds bullpen, not throwing at this moment. Of course, Singrani is out of the game. He was pinch hit for by Mesoraco. Get the runner bird to third as Votto goes out 4 3. And here comes Frazier with a runner at third and two out, two in. You've been following that game tonight, uh, Miami and Washington with uh, the former Red Matt Latos going tonight. Uh, Matt Latos right now, of course, is throwing the ball pretty well. They're in the bottom of the seventh inning there. Latos leads the, Mar leads the Marlins to a two to one advantage over the Nationals, but Steven Strasburg only pitched three innings in that ball game. He gave up a couple of runs and they came out. I did not know why. I'm just flipped the note. Thanks for passing it over this way, Jim, that Strasburg left the game in the third inning with an apparent shoulder injury, right shoulder. That's not good news for Strasburg nor the Nationals. And they are struggling much more than anybody ever thought they would, the Nationals. In fact, a lot of people picked them as the best team in the National League begin the year. Yes, they did. They are coming into tonight a game under. Hard hit by Frazier, handled by Gung, and the inning is over. The Reds at three against Antonio Bastardo take a 7-1 lead into the bottom of the ninth. Ohio has been brought to you by your local Toyota dealers, proud sponsor of the Cincinnati Reds. Reds gunning for a victory here tonight against the Pirates, leading big 7-1. They pounded out 12 hits against this Pittsburgh club. 
And Aronis Chapman, who hasn't appeared in a week, is in there now in a non-save situation. Well, you got to get him a little tune-up from time to time. Plus, you've already had him warming up down the bullpen in anticipation of coming into a game which would have been a safe situation. So while he's warmed up, you bring him in the game. Why waste the innings warmed up? So he's got five, six, and seven to deal with here to put this thing away for the Reds, who are looking pretty good right now. Interesting. You look at the Pirates who went into that Cardinal series that we talked about earlier, lo losing all three of those games in walk-off fashion against the Cardinals. They had started to play a little bit better. They were two games above the 500 mark. They had won six of their last eight games. All of a sudden, they close out that road trip in St. Louis and are beaten all three times. They lose this game. It would be their fourth in a row. As Chapman has that one fly back to the backstop on him. Here it is. Might be a little rusty out there. Here's okay. one of those stats that uh, people like you truly love. On six days rest, he doesn't show much rust. Other than on that first day. Yeah, the one thing that I've noticed about Chapman here this year, especially compared to the last couple of years, it used to take him five or six, maybe even eight pitches to to get up to the hundred mile an hour mark. Now he comes right out of the bullpen. His first or second offering is right around ninety nine or one hundred. Take a little bit off that pitch. Those are numbers to brag about if you're three for nine against a roll Chapman. You aren't kidding. Now we'll get a look at a three two pitch here to start the bottom of the ninth with the Reds up seven to one. Pedro Alvarez on deck. And ball four. Well, you can say what you want about the Reds bullpen lately, but certainly in the last couple of games, really you can go back to that Atlanta series, including that series, and so far here, they're starting to turn the uh, turn the corner a little bit. Well, in this situation with the roll to Chapman, you're not worried about losing the lead. I mean, the Reds are up by six, and they need just three outs to get. But what you don't want to see is Chapman labor through this inning. And throw a lot of pitches and not be able to use him either tomorrow or maybe even three days in a row or even four days in a row. However, you know, the maximum that you think you can get out of Chapman, you want this to be a nice, easy tune up and nothing more. He gets Alvarez here, who's 0 for 9 against the hard throwing lefty, including six strikeouts. He just helped him by chasing two pitches out of the zone. Go figure. I mean, the only way that the Pirates are going to get back into this ball game is to, uh, with the help of some bases on balls. And he's looking at 0-2 instead of 2-0. and Throw another one up there. He does, and he chases, and three uh, pitches, and down goes Alvarez on. Well, no better time to pick that one. A strikeout of Pedro Alvarez as our Cholula hot sauce flamethrower of the game. 102. MPH. Wow. Here is Gung, who is 0 for 2 with a walk. An interesting story uh, C. Trent Rosecrans had in the uh, in the inquiry talking about Gung facing Chapman. He says it would be the biggest test in determining whether he can be a successful major leaguer. He says, I want to see how hard he can pitch. 
See Trent writes that. I want to see the follow up story. Thank you Dave. Well he gets his chance right here. Broken bat foul out in front of it two and one. That one was at 100. Coming into this game, 26 and a third scoreless inning streak going for a rollish Chapman. Dating back to August the 17th of last year. Wow. Longest by a Reds pitcher since 1974. Now you may not know this Jim but in the Korean League professional league. Do they measure the speed of the fastball in miles per hour or kilometers per hour. I have no idea but I would guess kilometers. Three and two. So do you know the conversion rate. Come on. Me. No. You. Well we're going to ask to ask. Uh, Dave Ermacher. Ball four. So two walks in the inning by Chapman. And it really would have been three walks had Pedro Alvarez shown a little bit of patience at the plate and not chased three pitches in a row up around his eyeballs. Talked about Chapman not having given up a run since August the 17th last year. That was the first game of a doubleheader at Colorado. Remember, that was the game in which the Reds had the big lead in game one, but gave up five in the bottom of the ninth and lost that game 10 to 9. He gave up four, did Chapman in that game. Gave up four runs, walked four, didn't retire a batter. To 28 pitches. Meanwhile, Michael Lorenzen watches between Skip Schumacher and Zach Cozart. He can nail down his first big league win. Now Pena will go to the mound to talk with Chapman, who is obviously heated up about the way things are going right here. Yeah, and looks a little frustrated in the process. I mean, he knows what he's got to do. And in this case, I mean, short of Jeff Pico running out there and trying to calm him down and get him going. He's got to be his own pitching coach. He's got to know what little item in his delivery keeps him all together. What does he think of to keep it smooth where he can get that pitch out in front of him and get it down? And it can't be just rearing back and throwing as hard as you can because that's not working. Not close on that one, the Mercer. So, what do you do if you're Brian Price? You go out there yourself and talk to him. Well, that might not be a bad idea. There's been no visit to Chapman other than by Pena, which doesn't count as a visit to the mound. Sean Rodriguez, meanwhile, will bat for Bastardo. Base is loaded. One out. And a six run lead by the Reds here in the bottom of the ninth. Last time Chapman walked three in a game was that game in which he walked the four at Colorado on August the 17th. So a week off and a struggling performance here by Chapman. He gets Rodriguez the pinch hitter. Chapman gets ahead, nothing and two. Twenty two pitches now for Chapman getting into that range that you were talking about.
Polanco on deck. Well, the Reds don't have an off day coming through the weekend. When they leave here, go to the White Sox and play a weekend series there in the interleague play, you know, you're you're looking at wanting to use your closer, but you're not sure when you're going to use them. And you don't want him wasting these pitches, these precious pitches, in games that are seemingly out of reach anyway. And so With he gets Rodriguez right. away. I don't know what that number is as far as number of pitches in an, in an inning, which would keep Chapman from pitching his third day in a row or his third day out of four. I wouldn't imagine that 25 is too many, and Brian Pena happy that he got a strikeout right there. So he's going to work him through one more as now the rain has begun to fall here at PNC Park. And we've avoided it all night. Yesterday at this time, the Percentage for rain today called for 100 percent around game time, but a lot of that big storm as we were talking about earlier shifted north and we've been very lucky here tonight weather wise careful now you sound a little like Marty <laughs> predicting the rains coming down and the skies are going to open up one ball one strike to Polanco tonight 0 for 4. Three walks have loaded the bases for the Pirates against Chapman here in the bottom of the ninth. He has a cushion of a 7 1 lead. Boy, both those last pitches very close as Chapman stares in, wanting a call there from Ted Barrett, not getting it. He's a pitch away now from walking in a run. Three and two. I'll tell you what. They do use kilometers in Korea. And if you throw 100 miles an hour, it's about 161 or so, 160 miles an hour. Wouldn't that look so much more impressive? Swing and a miss. Right there. See ya at 160. And the Reds win the first game of this series. And Michael Lorenzen gets his first big league victory. In his second major league start, as the Reds win it by the final score of seven to one tonight over the Pittsburgh Pirates. Well, a very business-like win for the Reds tonight. They came out, and took care of business right from the very beginning with Michael Lorenzo on the mound, taking control, throwing strikes, breaking balls. Everything was working for him tonight in his six innings of three-hit, one-run baseball. He is our. Steel power tool performer of the night. Congratulations, Michael Lorenzo. After the off day, nice to get a victory here in game one of this series. Seven to one over the Pirates. Reds now four and zero against Pittsburgh this year. Back to the 500 mark. 13 wins and 13 losses on the year. All right, other side of the break. Reds live post game presented by Performance Kings Honda. That's coming up next. Reds win in Pittsburgh.